Lord, be the air that we breathe. Praise May Jesus. we be desperate and hungry for you. Yes. Praise you. that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things 
we cannot see. Faith is not grounded in facts. That's where it gets kind of controversial. Now, we believe that there are a lot of facts that support the Word of God, and we believe there are a lot of facts within the Word of God that tell us how we should live our lives. But faith is not based in facts. Facts are, are completely opposite of faith sometimes. Sometimes your doctor might tell you something. He might say, hey, you're going down the hill. You're going to be gone in, in a month. And you might say, you know what? I don't think so. I believe in God. And in the face of the facts, your faith is greater than those facts. And when the doctor's checking up on you three months later, you say to him, I'm still in. <laughs> See, faith is bigger than facts. And in faith is believing with confidence in the things that we're hoping for. And the reason that a lot of Christians get ridiculed, and the reason that a lot of Christians get scorned, is because of faith. Because the world looks at facts and evidence and what they can see, and they go, this is scary. <coughs> and somebody with a lot of faith goes, I'm not scared, bring it on. And they look at that person and go, you are crazy. Because you're believing in what you can't see. You're believing in something that's not there. Faith is not something that's tangible. But yet at the same time, it's a gift. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. Having faith. Faith to believe something. And it, it says here that it's confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Faith is knowing that no matter what goes on in this world, your life is in God's hands. And that's an assurance. That's like, that's like, wow. You know what? It doesn't matter. God's what matters. And so faith is a very important thing to have as a believer. You cannot be a believer without faith. And sometimes, I think sometimes people want hard facts and evidence. And they go, if you give me hard facts and evidence, then I believe something. Duh. <laughs> Anybody will believe anything with hard facts and evidence. That's pretty easy. Faith is stepping beyond that and going, I don't necessarily have everything here that proves to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is true, but I'm going to take that step. And when you put your faith in something, you manifest your faith in it, such as if you ask someone a question. If I'm going down the street and I'm, I'm driving down Century Boulevard and I say, hey, could you tell me where the nearest Taco Bell is? And a person looks at me and goes, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh. <laughs> and they start giving me instructions. I'm putting faith in what they say. My wife is putting faith in what I won't get lost. You see, you know. But that takes faith. When you ask your children a question, if you want an honest answer, you have to put some faith in them and answer them to you. It takes faith to do practically anything. Because if you look at statistics, some of you do jobs that are kind of dangerous. There's a good percentage of the fact that something could go wrong and you could die in a horrible accident. If you didn't have any faith in the fact that you could do your job, you wouldn't want to wake up in the morning and get out of bed. It takes faith to be an atheist. I might not be 
able to prove to you beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a God. But you can't prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that there isn't one. So it takes faith to be an atheist. It takes faith to believe in science. Because there's gaps in between science that, that are revelation, and, and then there's, there's experimentation that has proven things to be a fact, but there's also speculation in between. And it takes faith. I put my faith in God. Some people put their faith in a missing way. But nonetheless, it's faith. And so it's interesting that the world ridicules Christians for faith because the world has to have faith every day. They have to have faith in everything that they do. So faith is a part of our lives. Whether you accept it or not, whether you're religious or non-religious, you need faith. Even George Michael said, you've got to have faith. <laughs> but number two, we are made right with God through faith. We're made right with God through faith. Wearing long dresses, our hair in a bun, no makeup. No, thank God we're not made right with God that way. I don't look good at a dress. <laughs> we're made right with God by faith. By believing that the blood of Christ is our righteousness. Not with the filthy rags that we have. Not with the you know. Let me put it this way. If you were opening an art gallery and you wanted one of the masterpieces through history and time that has, has been displayed like you wanted the Mona Lisa or you wanted uh, Vincent Van Gogh, you wanted something that was amazing to blow people away. Would you say, you know, rather than that, I'm going to have a three-year-old scribble with crayons on a piece of paper. Is the equivalent of scribblings from a three-year-old on a piece of paper, is that the equivalent of a masterpiece? No. The Bible says our righteousness is filthy rags, and what, what it basically states is we're scribbling on pieces of paper with three-year-olds. And we can't get close to that masterpiece level. We couldn't make ourselves right. And because of that, Jesus had to take our place and make us right. Romans 3, 27 through 28 says, Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it's based on faith. So we're made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Now, these are the scriptures that got Martin Luther to thinking. Because at one time the church was saying, if you want to be made right with God, all you have to do is Pay us 30 pieces of gold and we will write you a pardon for your sins. Absolution. If you can't afford that, we would be more than happy to torture you until your death is dead. Would you like a religion like that? Sounds like a lot of fun. Faith, what Jesus did on the cross, is the only way. So number three, the purpose of faith is complete and utter trust in God and His goodness. The purpose of faith is complete and utter trust in God and His goodness. Now we do everything to combat that. We do. Everything about our society is the opposite of faith. I hate to say that, but it's true. Even hear a practical message. And practical messages are good. And they appeal to our logic. 
but they don't. And somebody gets up there and says, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> there was a man in a flood. He was waiting to be rescued, and he asked God to rescue him. And a boat came by, and then another boat, and then a helicopter. When he died, he said, God, why didn't you rescue me? And God said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> See, people, be practical. Don't trust in God. See, the point of that is, you've got to look for God in the natural. And looking for God in the natural is basically saying, don't look for the supernatural. And then looking for God in the natural means, also, if God doesn't show up in the natural, you've got to hedge your bets. So guess what we do? We insure everything. We insure everything. We insure ourselves. We insure our cars. We insure our houses. We everything we can we insure. Isn't that kind of weird? Our life insurance, health insurance, home insurance, car insurance. And I am, oh Lord, I'm just trusting in you. Lord, I'm trusting in you and anything you can do, Father. Insurance will take care of. Thank you. And Lord, anything that insurance can't take care of. Father, I thank you for providing FEMA. And our wonderful government. Lord, they, they, they love us so much. They will keep going into the hole and giving us stuff that they don't have so that we can continue to live lifestyles we don't need. Thank you, Jesus. And not a lot of faith in our lives today. You think insurance is the only thing that we put our faith in? What about drugs? I'm not talking street drugs. Those are just recreation. <laughs> I thought you can't watch television without a couple drug commercials every time there's a break. And they're always, it's always like, you know, do you suffer from allergies? Yes, I do. Well, take this pill. Uh, it'll cure you of your allergies. and give you bleeding diarrhea and your body parts will drop off. <laughs> I think I'll take the allergies. Really, the side effects of some of these things, you know, I love the ones that end in this, and in rare cases, death. <laughs> I don't have the hiccups anymore. It's because you're dead. That pill killed you. <coughs> we put our faith in drugs. Science. For little things. Do you remember when doctors used to just heal the sick? I mean, that was their purpose. He had a broken leg, we have a sedative. Now we have doctors to change the way your face looks. We have doctors that will give you a new nose if you don't like your old nose. They'll give you Botox so you can not express yourself for a while. <laughs> They'll do everything. They'll give you new body parts. They'll make you look good. Maybe God made you the way you are for a purpose. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus can use ugly. <laughs> but you're not ugly. That's the thing, nobody's really ugly. Because beauty is subjective. You know what that means? That means somebody who's beautiful is ugly to somebody else. And so you got to think about these things. All these things in our society basically take away, they chip away. Here's how to fix something. You know, go to a, go to a psychiatrist or, or watch Oprah. Or, you know, everything takes away and chips away from our utter dependence on God. And we wonder why God doesn't intervene in our lives. We do. I, you know, I, I had a... Um, I had a friend that was pretty wealthy. And my friend had a ton of dough in the bank and never, he'd never spend it. And he was constantly sick, constantly going to the doctor, and constantly getting this fixed and that fixed. And uh, he came to me one day and he was, I'm so mad at God. And I said, why are you mad at God? Because I watch other people get healed and they pray for this and they pray for that and it doesn't happen to me. I thought about the 
rich young ruler, he said. And, and I wanted to say to him, well, empty out your bank account, give everything you have away, cancel all your insurance policies, and trust in you. But I didn't want to get hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the truth. A lot of us have means. And when we have means, we don't need faith. If God has given you provision, you've already got the provision to take care of something. And some people are like, well, I wish God would sustain me. You want God's sustaining power in your life? Then start believing His Word and living a kingdom life. Give Him everything. And He'll take care of you. But it's nicer to take care of ourselves. To hedge our bets. To have something on the back burner in case this faith thing doesn't no, no, be wrong. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 12. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God. When God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance, he went without knowing where he was going. Praise God. Nicole says I do that all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, do you have a clue where we're going? No. What did they again? Oh, you're no, running guess. Um, Abraham had everything. He was, he was a wealthy man from a wealthy family. God said, uproot yourself. I'm sending you to a different place. It took a lot of faith. Abraham was very comfortable. And he could have been comfortable for the rest of his life. But there was a greater blessing here waiting on the other side of his manifest faith. Even when he reached the land, verse 9, that God had promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Isn't that interesting? Follow me. What are you going to do? I'm going to put you in a land that you'll never really possess. Or you get to live in tents. You move around a lot. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It'd be like camping all the time. Do you guys like camping? I don't like camping. I like showers. That's what I like. Hot showers. Yeah. And, and camp showers are just useless because you're dirty and you're filthy. You walk into a dirty, filthy place, take a dirty, filthy shower, walk back out into dirty and filthy again. And some people bathe in the lakes. I went camping with a pastor up in Alaska. And he just had a bar of ivory soap because it floats or something like that. But he had this bar of soap that was floating. And he's in the lake washing himself and scrubbing and singing. And I'm like, I don't know if the fish like that. <laughs> it was like, you know, this school of fish goes by while he's washing himself. One of them's like, did we say something wrong? Did we swear? <laughs> um, but, yeah, just this, this, this constant feeling of this is my land of promise. This is my home, but I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. Think about, think about being promised children. And then all of a sudden you're 100 years old and you don't have the children that you've been promised. You don't have your own land. You don't have. But Abraham still had faith. He still trusted God. His children trusted God. Verse 10 says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Let me let you in on a little secret. What we're doing here is practice. There is nothing here like what is to come. Nothing. 
And no matter how rich you get or how blessed you get, it doesn't compare to what God has waiting for you. That's why the Bible says don't grow weary and well doing. For in due season you'll reap a harvest. But it might not be down here. We have to keep doing the things God called us to do through faith, but we have to have eyes that are eternal, not eyes that are like, well, okay, if it doesn't work out, then I'm scrapped. Abraham was waiting for a city built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She was 90. Man, that's old. I'm going to have a child. If you were 90 and you were having a kid, you wouldn't be too happy. Trust me. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there's no way to count them. You're part of that nation. You're drafted in part. Still, you're part of those kids. And this is thousands of years later. We're still talking about him. That's what faith can do. This is my last point this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you if you'll exercise your faith with us and join us on a 21 day game. And before I, before I get into reading this um, scripture, um, I did talk a little bit about this at length Sunday night. And if you, if you would be interested in, in, in hearing that, I will, I will post it this week on Facebook. And I can also make you a DVD if you want more uh, to understand more. Also... I handed out fasting guides, prayer and fasting guides for those who want to want to take this journey with us, and those are on the back table. Uh, we still have quite a few left, and, and I can email them to you if, if you run out of copies, or or else make you uh, more copies um, and have them here uh, for you tonight. Um, uh, also, in your bulletin, uh, you each got a card. That's a commitment card. If you're husband and wife, you can put both your names down and you can fill out these cards together. Um, but I'm going to be collecting these at the, at the end of the message. And if you don't have a bulletin or if you didn't get one of these cards, there are some extra cards on the back table. And so uh, I want you to be aware of that. Um, but let's take a look at this, uh, our scripture, Daniel. And uh, we're looking at uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were four Hebrew children who were raised in Judaism. And when Babylon came and took the nation captive, the king was interested in having wisdom from every tradition that there was. Now, the kings back then highly believed and were very superstitious. They believed in magic, they believed in astrology, they believed in any kind of religion that there was. They, they kind of had a pantheon of gods. And so the king's court in Babylon was surrounded with all of these different religious perspectives. There were sorcerers and astrologers. There were priests from uh, Baal worship. There were priests from uh, uh, Dagon worship. There were priests from different aspects of different cultures that had been captive. And one of the things that the king wanted to do was he said, I want some of the Hebrew wise men to come and sit on my council. So they looked for some godly young men who the Hebrews would consider godly and wise. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the four men that they chose. And they came and they lived in the palace with the rest of the, 
astrologers and, and occultists and the false religions that, that, that dominated the king's time and giving him direction because if he didn't like advice from one person, he'd go to another person and go to another person. And there was a plethora of different counsels that he could have. Well, these people used to eat and the king was always trying to honor them to keep them well fed and keep them really in good shape and everything. And so they would get a lot of the, a lot of the, the foods that came from the king's table, the, the kind of the leftovers, but really good food, better than anybody else in the kingdom was getting. They would get, uh, you know, king might have a pig roast one night, and, and they would get half a pig the next day. And the king might have a, a big beef, and, and they'd get all this, and they'd get all that. And some of the food that the king would get was actually, some of it was food that had been sacrificed to idols, too, and used in pagan worship. Now, Daniel had a problem with this because Daniel was a godly Jew. And one of the things that the Jews did was they ate a kosher diet. There are certain animals that they didn't eat to remain clean. And there are also certain things that they didn't eat as far as food sacrificed to idols. And so Daniel wanted to make a deal that would get him and his Hebrew brothers out of the situation where they were being caused to, to compromise. It said in verse 8, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission to not eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of the king, my lord. My lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat his food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Now, once again, we're talking about faith here. Daniel's taking a stand for faith. And what's the worldly perspective? You can't do that. You can't do that. This food is my insurance policy. Because it keeps you guys looking healthy and good. You can't take that away from me. So, Daniel responded. He spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which those are the Hebrew names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Please test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. So the attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. He said, okay, if you guys want to do this, I can do that. Because then I'll just tell you to go back to eating regular food and nobody will know anything that you have. Big, big deal. At the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided the others. So basically, everybody went on the Daniel diet. <laughs> Thank buddy. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can imagine the pagan priests weren't too happy about that. No more bacon. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we see here the aspect of why they're taking a stand. Now, the Daniel fast is a 21-day fast, and it doesn't come from this scripture, uh, but this scripture is a, a guide to what Daniel's fast would consist of. The Daniel fast comes from Daniel chapter 10. And it's where Daniel's waiting to hear from the Lord. And, and he's got this vision that troubles him. He doesn't know what to think of it. And so he begins to pray and to fast. And he says, I ate no choice meats or wines during this time. And, and basically choice, a, a lot of people believe that that means sweet. And so... Uh, when a lot of people Daniel fast, here's what they do. No sweets, no meats. And if you can remember that, you're pretty much on your way, because that's basically what it is, essentially. Um, historically, in our culture, there have been secular fasts for other reasons, and people have done things. Uh, how many of you remember the... Uh, um, the, the the war on terror. 
started after September 11th and how we were going to other countries fighting to Iraq. During that time, President Bush, uh, his favorite treat uh, were Reese's peanut butter cups. And he decided he wasn't going to have any more Reese's peanut butter cups as long as we were fighting that war. And so he cut them out. Now, that's a way of fasting. That's a form of fasting. And when we talk about the Daniel Fast, if you want more information, I'm not going to go through all of the tidbits and the information right now, but it is on the back table. A lot of people just eat vegetables and fruit and drink water. But some people might have different kind of diets, or, or, or some people might, you know something, to be honest with you, giving up food might not bug any of you. Might not bug some of you. You might go, oh, I could do that all day. I love fruits and veggies. Bring it home. <laughs> Maybe for 21 days you need to do something else. Maybe you need to shut off the television. Maybe you need to stay off the internet. What? <laughs> no. Maybe you need to shut your cell phone off. But I'd love to do that for 21 days, but I get in trouble. Um, Maybe there's something else that's more important to you. But what it is is simply this. Is it's saying, I'm going to give something up for 21 days. And I'm going to pray for 21 days. And I'm going to ask God to intervene in my life. And to do that, it takes a step of faith. Because it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. The first, the first couple days, I've done this before, and the first couple days we did it, it was very hard. And then... And then we got kind of into a flow. And actually, by the fourth or fifth day, it got pretty easy. And it actually felt pretty good. And, uh, and, and, and as we went through it, uh, by the time we, uh, like I said last week, by the time we got done with it, we had done 21 days of fruits and vegetables. And, and uh, we had a few, uh, I think we had cheese and milk, some byproducts, but we ate no meat. We had no sweets, no sugary things. Uh, by the time we got done, I said, oh, this is the end of the 21 days, and we made it. I said, you know what, we should eat like this all the time. She said, yeah. But then like a couple days later, we were at McDonald's, forget about it. But, um, <laughs> but it's one of those things where if you make that commitment, God will help you. And if you keep that commitment, God will bless you. And if you endure to the end, God is going to speak to you. God's going to speak to your heart. You might have some personal battles you're fighting. We need to fight some battles spiritually for this community, for this church. We need to humble ourselves before God for this country. There's a lot of things going on now. You can't turn on the night in the news without knowing that. And I believe God is calling us to exercise our faith. We weren't the only ones who experienced the good things on this. I remember some of our people who took this challenge. And, and, and interestingly enough, we did commitment cards last year and filled them out for the day of fast. And uh, it's a 21-day fast. At the end of the service, we collected the cards. And uh, the next day, I counted how many people have fasted. 21 people have fasted. And uh, there was a woman who was healed of some feminine issues during the fast. We had a guy who, his joints were all messed up. And uh, he learned how to roll. Right? Yeah. He learned how to, he learned how to walk. <laughs> he learned how to walk right once he, uh, once he started getting sugar out of his diet. And before the Daniel fast, he'd walk into the church. I remember the other day, he'd like, come in, molding and kind of, <laughs> And, and towards the end of that Daniel fast, he just moved smooth. And he realized that it was helping his joints. He called his doctor, who, or he called his, his daughter, who was actually a nurse, and he said, I don't get this. I feel better. All I did was cut out sweets. How did that affect me? His daughter was a nurse. She said, well, actually, sugar's an inflammatory. And if you've got joint problems, Sugar can actually agitate. And so he was like, oh, yeah. We had a, we had a guy who uh, 
during that time. He, he, he was fasting and Daniel fast. And he'd, been a, he'd been a lifelong, pretty much a lifelong chewer. Okay? Since he was about two weeks old. How just he was. So, um, but as he was on his fast, he was like, you know what? I've given up all this food and it's not bugging me. He said, I think I'm going to quit chewing. Let's see how it goes. And it didn't bug him. But the next day after, after he decided to quit, he said, usually at work, nobody ever offered him to chew. He said that, that day he got offered to chew like four or five different times and he was trying to quit. If you ever try to quit something, if you go, man, I'm not going to drink any pop anymore. I'm going to quit that. You'll go to somebody's place and go, like, hey, would you like a pop? <laughs> and like, um, but uh, but we, we saw amazing things happen. And people were touched. People's lives were touched. And they just got closer to God. It was, it was pretty cool. And so I want to challenge you to do this. And uh, if, if you'll be willing to uh, take this challenge with Join us on this fast this evening. Please fill out this card. Right now. And we're going to have a little prayer. And then what I'd like you to do is, is, as a sign of your commitment, before you leave this morning, just come and lay your card down on the altar. And just kind of, you know, that's, that's the way of saying, God, I'm committed to these 21 days. And, and they, they start tomorrow. Tomorrow's when it starts. If, if you're not ready for it tomorrow, you can start your 21 days. Tuesday or Wednesday or you know whatever you need to do, but uh, uh, if you start with us tomorrow, you'll be done on the 28th. Um, I wanted to start the very first of January, and Nicole said, "No, we're having a luau." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, so we'll ham it up tonight and start tomorrow." Um, but uh, so uh, keep that in mind. And, and if you have any prayer requests, you can put your prayer request down there. And they will be confidential and they will be prayed over uh, during this time. So uh, let's just uh, go to the Lord right now. And, uh, Father God, in Jesus' name, we just come to you, Lord. And God, I pray that you increase our faith, God. Help us to put our faith in you in such a way that you're glorified in all that we do. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would be with those who are going to make this commitment to take this journey with us. For these next 21 days, Lord, I pray that your word would just speak to our hearts, Lord. That we would get closer to you in prayer. And God, that we would begin to see the fruits of some of this in our church, God. In our community, Lord Jesus. In our state. And in our nation. Lord Jesus, we are at a time... When our nation needs to humble itself and turn its heart towards you, God. Lord, you said in your word that judgment begins in the house of God, so may we turn our hearts towards you and humble ourselves before you so that we can begin to set the pace for this nation, God. Lord, help us as believers to return to you in a mighty way, Lord. And I just pray that you just be with us. Walk with us this day. Bless your people. We come to you in faith, knowing you are good. And we just seek you with all of our hearts and souls and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you'd like to make this commitment with us, you can bring your card down and lay it on the altar. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.